Hi, I'm Susan Wise Bauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. Today, we are so excited to be joined by Dr. Anika Prather because we have some really important topics to talk about today. We're so happy you're here. Anika, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and what you're passionate about? Yes. Um, so I am the founder of the Living Water School, a classical school. It's virtual now. It used to be in person, but now it's virtual so we can serve more students around the nation. And we have been trying to have this conversation for what feels like forever. So yes. it's, it's like it's like the, the it's like some sort of forces in the universe marshaled against us to get it together, yes. which sometimes means we're doing something really important. So right. I think this is an important conversation we're about to have. Yes. Right. On this season of the podcast, we've been talking about all things classical education, what it is, what it isn't, where it came from, where it's going. And one of the critiques that we often hear, especially more recently about classical education, is that it is Eurocentric, or rather that it promotes the literary canon and the history and the ideas of Western or specifically white civilization at the expense of other literary traditions. And so I'm so excited that we have you here, Anika, today, because you've studied this, you've talked a lot about kind of the intersection of the canon and the black intellectual tradition. And so we're going to talk about is classical education Eurocentric? Is it irreversibly and unchangeably Eurocentric? And if it is, what do we do about that? Mm, I love this topic. <laughs> oh, and also we should we should sort of insert in there, there's Eurocentric and then there's Americentric, which are not mm -hmm. exactly the same things. Because yes. although we are heirs in America of the European tradition, obviously, since we were colonized by Europeans, but at this point, our tradition has become something quite different. Um, yes. mm -hmm. with much more of a, a flavor of we've got it right and nobody else does. Yeah. That, that is definitely something that is in um, the discourse about the American tradition, which isn't maybe quite as strong in some other, yeah. unless you're in France. France is a different thing, but right. yeah. So maybe we can pull those two things apart. But yes. I don't know, Sus Susanna, do you want to start out by defining Eurocentrism and then we'll let Anika respond to that? Yep. Sure. So I have a definition here from American University that says Eurocentrism is a worldview or mindset that centers European or white ways of knowing as sole, central mm. or superior to all others. Mm. So that kind of encapsulates this idea that like the, the white history is more important than anything else. That's yes. the only thing that is worth studying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's the pushback I get. Right. I mean, when I am talking about the black intellectual tradition or highlighting, well, there's two paths I take with this conversation. The first path is identifying diverse people who found inspiration in this beautiful tradition. That's really important to be able to see universally from continent to continent how impactful this trad tradition is. As an old pastor used to say, let me put a quarter in the meter right there. <laughs> I was just reading um, Chinua Achebe's There Was a Country, his oh. memoir. And there is a line. Do I have it here? Yay, I have it right here. There is, uh, can I read this quote? That I wish y'all could see it because she's so happy that she found this book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go for it. He says this beautiful quote. He was classically educated. His memoir talks about his education of his father and his education and how he processes receiving this, what they claim to be a Eurocentric or the education of the colonizer. The way he talks about it and how he's been able to use it for the elevation of his own heritage really captures what I feel about this tradition. And he says, English was the language of instruction at government college. I hope I'm saying this right. Umu Uhaya? Ihia? It was at Umu Ahia that I first truly understood the power and importance of that unifying language. Mm. The schoolmasters well aware that Nigeria had over 250 ethnic groups, had very carefully enrolled students from every nook and cranny of the nation where possible. While African languages and writing should be developed, nurtured, and preserved, how else I would wonder would I have been able to communicate with so many boys from different parts of the country and ethnic groups speaking different language languages had we not been taught one language? Interesting. Classical mm -hmm. education, according to um, Chinua Achebe, gave him the unifying language. And that unifying language, as opposed to him using it to assimilate 
or to look down on his own heritage and people, he used it to tell the story of his people so that everyone all over the world will be inspired by it. And he goes on to say that this type of education inspired other African writers who told our, their stories. And so that is how I'm seeing it. So that's one track, how people have been inspired by the canon and use the literacy gained from from this type of education to tell the stories of their own people, right? And we see that happen over and over in just African-American history. Those from those from Frederick Douglass being illiterate, giving himself a classical education, now being able to, you know, to be this advocate for freedom. Or we look at Phyllis Wheatley telling the story of her people, her country even, and her life through poetry. And so we could go on and on about that. So that's one path and that's important to talk about. I, I wonder if it might be this, I just, I love this idea that you bring up. And I was thinking of Frederick Douglass as you were speaking, and I know Frederick Douglass sometimes gets mixed reviews, but yes. he, he was, but he saw the European tradition as a way to move forward when he had no other path. Yes. Right. Yes. So now we have many paths. We have many more opportunities, which we can, you know, we, we can respect and follow and honor, but we have to also recognize that the European tradition was, you know, horrific in many ways to people of color, but also provided them with, I don't know, am I, am I misspeaking here? No, you're not, because there's a question when I was teaching at Howard, I would ask yep. at the end of the semester, after we'd studied classics and how it connected to Black people, I ended the semester with this question. It was a great discussion. Do we still need to study classics? Mm -hmm. Is it necessary anymore? Mm -hmm. And I would always have several, quite a few say, no, it's not necessary. We can just read the stories of our ancestors now because they have now translated for us. And there's no need to go back. And then I asked the second question. If you don't read what they read, do you fully understand what they're saying? If they are oh. citing those texts in mm. the book you now want to read, do you have full understanding of what they're saying if you haven't read the books that they're citing? Yeah. And they're like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, never thought about that. And that's why it's it's very much like a tree. You know, when you talk about how the different people of color, white people, black people, Asian people, Indian people, native people, even all types of people have been inspired by this tradition. And there's absolutely nothing we can do about that. We can't change that as horrific as that past is it's there. Yeah. It's just there. We can't change it. And so. There's an, another analogy of this, if you don't mind, is the book Kindred. Oh, yes. She really beautifully illustrates what I'm saying through that story. Because in order for the Black character, the main character, to save herself, she has to go back in the past and preserve the life of the master. Mm. And then mm. in the process of her doing that, she loses her arm. Sorry, spoiler alert. She loses her arm. What I think... The book is still really good, even if you know she loses her <laughs> like that, what I'm saying doesn't even take anything away from it. Oh, what Octavia no. Butler is illustrating so beautifully is that we need one another. And as bad as we, sadly, slavery has so mixed us together. Mm -hmm. Like if we tried to separate ourselves, we would kill us. It would kill us ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think we do better by allowing, you know, whatever heritage you're from. And if you're interested in this tradition, allowing your ancestors who connected to this tradition to guide you through it. Because if you don't do that, then you are just elevating a heritage outside of your own. But if you allow the, the, the ancestors to guide you, eventually you'll just enjoy the literature for what it is and you will learn from it. And so that's why I talk so much about diverse people who've connected to it. So that's one path, learning how different people read it and how it inspired their work. It will actually illuminate Black history even more for you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I can I just ask? I'm I'm wondering if we can come up with a better word. So, Susanna, you start out with the definition of Eurocentrism, which is a worldview mm -hmm. mindset that centers European or white ways of knowing as yeah. and use three words: soul, central, or superior. Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe the word that we really need to be picking at is normative. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that the Eurocent yes. that that Eurocentrism, the European or white way of knowing, isn't normative. It is a way. Yes, but it is it is a way. What I hear you saying, Anika, is that it's a way that 
for better or for worse, we are where we are, shaped the people that you respect and look up to as intellectual pillars of the Black community. But that doesn't mean we have to accept it as normative. We have to find another word for it. It's a really valuable, strong, healthy strain of thought but it's not the only one. And so we can't take no. it as the norm. No, I don't know how to, mm. I know, but I think of a better word. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if this is almost saying the same thing. I just think of it as a part of my human history. I mm-hmm. mean, mm-hmm. just like everything else, it's just, a. I don't think and an- another thing I like to say, this might be helpful to what I'm saying is um, I don't take classical education or that period or that tradition as superior. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. Yes. I look at it as, you know, I, I, I live in a foreign land. And and even though this is my home, my people have been here, like all of my ancestors were enslaved on both sides, my mom and my dad. And so I know that means my great, 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 great ancestors were from the continent of Africa. There was a literacy that was kept from us. Mm -hmm. When I teach classically and when I teach English and everything else, what I tell my students is this is not better than the language you speak at home. This story, this tradition is not better than you and your heritage. It is just me helping you become bilingual. Oh, I love that. Mm. Bilingual. Yes. As opposed to saying assimilation of things Mm -hmm. like that. Assimilation implies wiping something out. Exactly. Exactly. And so you're teaching classical education without overshadowing who the children are or who the students are. And so when you think of it as bilingual, and then this is another part of the story. This is how we, I usually start the year with this conversation. So they're ready. As I say, if we move to, if, if we decided to go to France, people love to go to different countries, not just Africa. We go to different countries just to experience culture. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to get a book to translate the language so you can be able to speak to someone. If you decide to live there, you're going to try to figure out how to learn the language so you can just survive. And it doesn't mean that who you are disappears. You've Mm -hmm. just learning this other literacy so you can survive in a foreign land. And I said, that's what your ancestors did. And that's what I'm trying to give to you because you need to learn this language just to survive. You need to learn how the government works. You need to learn the the, the, the literature that has undergirded this country. You need to learn the literacy, not because it's better. As James Baldwin says, where else am I going to go? Like, this is this is the only home that I will know. I can't I'm not going to go back to Africa, although I'd love to. But that's I've never been there. I've never lived there. So this is my home. So to be in this space, you're acknowledging that it is a foreign land. Right. And then you're learning the language of this foreign land so that you can find your way in the space and all the while holding on to your language and your heritage. Mm -hmm. There's there's also there's another way to do this and uh, or another way to think about this. And, you know, we're going to make a lot of people mad in this podcast anyway. So, Anika, we may as well make them a little bit madder. You and I are both academics, so we both know something about Marxist philosophy and we both know something about Hegel. And we both know what thesis, antithesis and synthesis is. Yes. So this is for all of you people who heard the word Marxist and started throwing tomatoes at your um, iPod or whatever it is you're listening to us on. Marxism is just a philosophy about the way things might possibly work. Okay, so yeah. so put away your fear for the minute and just listen to me. Right. And by the way, you know I've been called a closet Marxist. That's oh, I've been, I, people don't even bother to say closet when they call me a Marxist. <laughs> so, but, but but what you have to realize is that nobody who calls you a Marxist actually knows what that means. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So Hegel. Um, uh, the uh, German philosopher, you know, all good philosophies come out of Germany. We can unpack that later. Yeah. <laughs> pointed out, and I do think this is a really true insight, that the way that we arrive often at a workable philosophy of life is that there are two opposing ideas. There's the thesis, that's the one you start with. And in yeah. our context, I think that would be the European classical tradition because it was the one that was dominant. It was like wiping, you know, everybody wiping the map with everything else. Yeah. And then there's an antithesis. The antithesis is the thing that pushes back and says, mm-hmm. not necessarily, that's not the only way of knowing. That's yeah. not how everybody experiences the world. Hegel's point is that the thesis and the antithesis meet each other. And out of that grows something healthier, mm-hmm, which is the mm-hmm. synthesis. So yes. it seems to me that that's what you're talking about, yes. is that the synthesis mm. is not rejecting 
yeah. either the thesis, which could be completely overwhelming, or the antithesis, which could say, no, we're not going to have anything to do with this. Yes. But that they're they're able to come together and say, here is where we are. Here yes. are two traditions which were never, they, they didn't grow up in the same place. Mm-hmm. Kind of like being married, actually. I've been married for 32 <laughs> years. So, yeah. you know, you, you get married and you're like, wait, what? We're, right. we're doing what at Christmas? Right. <laughs> but somehow your thesis and antithesis melt oh, together. Oh, that's so that, that gives me a question, which is, you know, classical education is so closely associated with the Western canon, I feel, yeah. at, least, at least right now. And so how do we as classical educators get to that point of synthesis where we aren't overemphasizing one tradition or another, but allowing children to learn from the richness Ooh. of what's available to them now? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of times people use things like Marxism to cancel out those who may bring good trouble, as you said mm-hmm. earlier. Because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. you can kind of see a tradition, you can see a tradition if you go back during the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King was accused of being a communist and that he, he was considered an enemy of the government because of that. And he was very clear he wasn't that. He was, like you said, he was just trying to look at philosophies that might show him a way that's better than what he's experiencing uh, here in America during that time before the Civil Rights Act and before change started. It's still happening. Angela Davis um, studied forever like with a German philosopher mm. trying to study Marxism and things like that. And she may be a Marxist. A lot of Black Panthers were. I've met students at Howard University who were involved in the socialist movement and all that. But these are people, and I'm not. I, I, I told somebody else, I said, I think I'm truly a capitalist. I really like <laughs> earning money. And I like being able to be su- as successful as I want to be without anyone stopping me. Like there's, I don't, you know, I don't hide that. However, I understand why people are drawn to that. And that's, that's, it's okay to have conversations where we give people that grace. Mm-hmm. They were at a time where they couldn't move forward. They were, the government literally would not allow them to be considered equal. And even you know, this is these are true stories. If you just bought a new car, you could get lynched. You weren't allowed to progress yeah. at all. Right. So during that time, looking at something like Marxism, they're wondering, will this allow us at least to all be treated equal? And then mm-hmm. those who are still interested in that type of philosophy, that's because they're still experiencing the inequities of this country. And I actually was just mm-hmm. talking about this the other day with regards to education, how you notice that schools in challenged neighborhoods often are worse than schools in upper class neighborhoods and in the same state and district. And I've worked in schools like that. I worked for a county where I worked in the predominantly black and Hispanic neighborhood for my first four years. And then I worked in what they, and look, they called that lower county. And then I worked worked (laughs) in upper county and the two places, even though it was the same exact district, were vastly different. Mm -hmm. The quality Mm -hmm. of education was different. The experience, the exposure was vastly different, even though it was the same. And so this is during my lifetime. So when you are still seeing inequities around you, then you are drawn to those places, those philosophies that elevate the notion that we really should be just treated the same and fairly and equal. And Mm -hmm. so, but sadly, when people mention that in the world that we're in now, and in this place where America still hasn't gotten to the root of its racial issues, anyone who says anything remotely close to that, you're immediately discounted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's such a great observation, Anika, because there's this, and I think this probably covers a lot of the people who are interested in classical education. As soon as you say the word Marxist, it's like saying, I don't know, satanic? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> right? so it was like, but, but, you know, I've noticed the same thing in the Christian community, right? Yeah. Particularly during the 1970s, there was a huge interest in the Christian community in more socialist ideas, yes. not because those Christians wanted to be Satanists, but because they looked at socialism and Marxism and saw in it an example of of what Christ said yes. about caring well, for the weak, yep. sharing out what you have, giving away, even yep. pain, taking care of those who need help and are not getting help. Yeah. And of course, you know, socialism and Marxism both, I feel like, don't deal with the fact that people are fallen. And so yes. those who are in power are going to grab whatever. They, but 
that aside, Christian socialism and Christian Marxism, I feel like was a recognition of a beautiful ideal. I mean, and and there's been, there was an article that came out recently, I don't know if you've read it, where um, different pastors have been preaching about that very thing. So yeah. in Acts, the early mm-hmm. church, they shared everything in common or... Maybe, maybe Susanna, we could put a link in our show yes, notes. Yes, yeah, somebody wants show to notes. investigate the rabbit trail that yeah, we're on. There's, there, right? There's a rise <laughs> now that when these pastors preach this philosophy of Christ and how we um, take care of one another, take care of the poor. The actual verses that say you should be taking care of the widow, the orphan, the poor. Mm-hmm. Or when, when the children of Israel, one of the laws was leave some of the kernels for the poor. You know, that's how Ruth mm-hmm. and Boaz got together. Like right. When, socialism. Right. When, and so and so I heard this pastor one time say Jesus was a socialist. But now see, people are going to discount me. I'm not saying that. But what's <laughs> happening is as pastors are preaching these things in order to raise up empathy in the hearts of the people, they are now being accused of teaching socialism, even though they're sharing the scriptures. People, we've gotten so far away. And so, and so that's, and that attitude and this, and to bring it back to what we're talking about with classical education, Mm -hmm. those of us who feel like this should be for everyone Mm -hmm. and everyone should feel Mm -hmm. welcomed in this space. Mm -hmm. And we are not here to elevate Europe over Africa. Mm-hmm. You're yep. immediately considered a socialist. You're immediately con- mm-hmm. that's communist talk, you know. And so they cut you off. And and I believe there are people who are unaware that that type of thinking is purposed to preserve white supremacy. I think mm. they have really bought into, oh, no, we just want to protect this beautiful tradition. We don't need to mess it up with talking about all these other people. Mm-hmm. We should just celebrate it for what it is. But it's been something special for everyone across the globe. We need mm-hmm. to talk about that. Well, OK, so so this is this is actually this is a great transition. Nika. I don't want to cut you off from whatever you're about to say next. So please feel free feel free to say it. But you, we started off with you talking about how your, your black students in particular, maybe felt some suspicion towards the classical tradition and said, why should we study this? Why is this important? And I feel like we've talked through some of the ways in which that white European tradition is important for your black students. But you have also gotten a fair amount of pushback from the white side of classical education. Oh, absolutely. Towards your even questioning. I don't even know what you've been questioning, because as far as I can tell, you haven't said anything particularly radical. I think what's heartbreaking about it is I haven't. Like I, Mm -hmm. I, I've tried to speak from a heart of grace, I just came out with an article at, uh, through Notre Dame's, um, one of their journals, University of Notre Dame, talking about the healing power of love. And so I feel mm-hmm. like I have a perspective that's not combative, that's not trying to cancel anyone, that's not trying to make white people disappear or even, I mean, I actually feel like all of us are important. I mm-hmm. think people are struggling with that. I mean, I've actually had someone argue with me that stop saying that Europe is important. It's come up with all of this, that and the other. And, and, and they'll name all these things like the Pythagorean theorem. And then if I say back, yes, the Pythagorean theorem is a great example, but he studied in Egypt for 21 years before mm-hmm. Alexander the Great got there. So he was studying with African people. Right. But people don't want to have those conversations. And that actually, you know, I talked about earlier, my two paths. One is how classical education has inspired diverse people. The other mm-hmm. path I always bring up is let's talk about how Africa has influenced the classical tradition. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's talk yeah. about how Africa and the Middle East has influenced the classical tradition. And one of the one of the greatest examples I use to help me understand, to help people understand what I'm saying is the vision of Daniel and mm-hmm. that there was this statue, right, that Daniel envisions mm-hmm. where he has, I can't remember off the top, but each part of the statue is made out of a different metal. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it shows the different civilizations. The head is gold and the bronze mm-hmm. is shoulders yeah. and then yeah. the feet are clay mixed clay right. under. Yeah. Which yeah. represents the Roman Empire, right? Which is where the classical tradition is coming. But well, I'm going to leave that alone. But I. <laughs> my, that really would be a rabbit trail. <laughs> yes. But my, where I'm going, the reason I use that statue is this is that every human civilization is birthed out of another. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so it wasn't that the world was just, it didn't, the Lord didn't say in Genesis, okay, let there be Europe. (laughs) The the world was started, right? (laughs) The the world was started with all of humanity being great, right? They were, I mean, look at that. Like, and when they, when he was building, I'm just speaking scripture. I'm not saying CRT. I'm not talking about Ibram Kendi. I'm just saying, this is what the Bible tells me. 
Mm-hmm. At the mm-hmm. beginning, the Lord started the world in the Middle East, somewhere between the Middle East and Africa, mm-hmm. right? He started the world there. Some yep. people say that was part of ancient Africa, but I'm not going to get into that argument right now. But he started in this place and all of humanity was birthed from that place. Then you go on a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit after Noah and all that. And you got the Tower of Babel. All of these people from all over the world are building this massive tower that even God said together, all these different people together are going to do something so great. They're going to forget about me. That story tells me that all of us are great. All of our ancestors were great. All right. So taking that notion. Now, when I read the Iliad or when I read Herodotus and I see these ancient African civilizations talked about by these ancient authors who talk about them with greatness. Euclid doesn't hide that he a lot of what he knows about geometry comes from the Egyptians. Pythagoras didn't hide it. You know, the early African Christian fathers, people acknowledge Augustine, Origen, and all of these, you know, early yeah. African fathers. And this is not, again, for me to say Black people are better than white people. I'm just saying we all are great. And to have and to teach our and classical education is a perfect philosophy of education to show children we all are great because the ancient writers talk about the greatness of Cyrus the Great, who was from the Middle East. They talk mm-hmm. about the greatness of the Ethiopians, you know? Mm-hmm. Was it Achilles? One of, in one of the stories, he's calling on Memnon to help him fight. Like, they were living in a world. Um, Frank Snowden has this book called Before Color Prejudice, and he has another book called Blacks in Antiquity. And he really unpacks how the ancient world viewed Africa as powerful. Mm-hmm. The Bible, the Torah, mm-hmm. the, 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 the Quran, all of these ancient texts talk about the greatness of people of color along with the greatness of the West. Well, I think you've, I think you've picked up on something in bringing up the tower of Babel, which is, it's not just that all people are great, which I a hundred percent agree with you, but then every, every culture says, but also we're better than God. I'm sorry. I thought I was in church. I started clapping. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. That's okay. That was. We'll keep that clap in. Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. But that that is then the next temptation is to say our way is best. Our mm-hmm. way is best, and those who do not hold to our way, we're just gonna again. We're, I'm gonna come back to this word normative. That yes. They're mm-hmm. subnormative. You know, yes. they're 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 below where we are. Yes. Um. And and that is what I hear you saying. Yes. Yes. And and I think a beautiful illustration of what I mean is this. I'll go back to Howard first. And I taught the same class at Howard University, University of Maryland, and Messiah University. So I taught the same class at all hmm. three. And the response of these lessons was the same, no matter what color the child was, the student, not child, but the college student was. When I would teach. Just simply, let's see people of color in classic text. And I would just pick different excerpts and just let you see it. Mm. I literally would have students crying in my class. Mm. Wow. That shocked me. I didn't realize one one student um, in his final essay wrote, I first... I was sitting in the airport headed home for Thanksgiving and Miss Dr. Prather had us read book five of the histories or something like that. And I sat there and he listened to Herodotus describe the Ethiopians of beautiful black people. And and he said, I sat there with tears in my eyes. Now, it's not that we need the West to verify our beauty, but part of the Western tradition, which is why it keeps that's why classical education keeps getting in trouble, has been to discount our beauty mm. and has skipped over those parts of of the histories they've skipped I, over you know those things and so i just have this i just have this sudden mental image of classical education as this um this this you know pretty well-intentioned white guy who's trying to do all the right things but every once in a while he's like no sit down and shut up i'm gonna do my thing <laughs> and then he has to run away and hide and apologize i'm sorry that was just that was just a mental image. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of what it felt like because that student said, I went to you know private schools all my life and we read these things and I never saw this. Mm-hmm. Or when I go to Messiah University or University of Maryland, I have I had one girl at University of Maryland who said, can I meet with you at the class? And she was visibly shaking. And she mm-hmm. said, hey, I thought I was smart. I th- I've been studying classics all my life mm-hmm. and I never knew any of that. I never saw this stuff, you know? Right. And so- and I'm not making it up. This is so when when I see different 
um, articles or blog posts. Um, someone has even done videos without naming me, but I know he's talking about me by just some of the quotes that are there. And they say, I am messing up classical education. I'm taking too much attention away. I'm saying I'm not making up. I'm not trying to make this black or make this diverse. Right. It is diverse. And that's okay, well, mm. yeah, let yeah, let's talk let's talk more specifically about that because um I know you've gotten I know you've gotten some pushback. I mean, I as as people who follow me on social media will know <laughs> I get pushback too. Yes. I usually get pushback for not being Christian enough. Mm. I don't generally get pushback for not being classical enough. And I wonder if that's because I'm white. Mm. So talk about the pushback that you've gotten. And and it doesn't sound like, again, doesn't sound like you're you're saying anything incredibly radical. You're saying we should read all of the ancient authors. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I don't see how that's radical, to be honest. Well, I think one of it, I've been, I've been called woke in a closet Marxist. That's, that's, oh, the, that's the, that's the, the latest conversation. And uh, as much as I want to go shopping, that definitely cannot be me. I'm not that. <laughs> <laughs> and that means I need to be capitalist to have as much money as I can to go buy as many shoes as I like. No, I'm just being <laughs> silly. But, um, but, <laughs> but my, that's kind of a side joke. I don't know what I'm saying, except the only thing I can determine is that because everything I say is backed by historic data, and I use the actual classic text to show the connections, mm. is that they're basically saying, we don't want voices of color here. You're not welcome here. And that is the message I am receiving is you're not welcome here. Because I don't say, it, I do talk about my racist experience, but I always come back with love, forgiveness, what God says, don't keep any records of wrongs. I always talk about the biblical way of handling racism. Because I do, endure, I mean, I can't lie about my daily experiences. I do go through racism in my life. I'm mm-hmm. not, and so, and when I, and so I talk openly about it, past and present as to share, but this is how I'm dealing with it, with the hopes that others will be inspired by it so that we can bring change. That's a problem for people. And so there's that. And then me wanting to talk about all the different diverse people mm-hmm. who are inspired by it and who are in it, the, the pushback communicates to me, but we don't want people of color in this. We, But we want you to study this. We want you to read this, but we only want you to elevate us. We mm-hmm. don't want you mm-hmm. to talk about Pythagoras was inspired by the pre-Alexandrian Egyptians. Mm-hmm. We don't mm-hmm. want to. We don't want to know that. We don't mm-hmm. want to know that Jesus's lineage is filled with people from all over the world. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. want him to be European. Stop talking about that. We want to be the dominant ones. We want to be the dominant narrative. Because I'm not saying any. I'm not saying I'm better than you. Nothing I say says I. Black people are better than you, or more important than you to talk about. Everything I say is always. We're all invited to this conversation. And classical education is a wonderful tool for inviting that com- that discourse. And so what that looks like is that the more I have that conversation, the less the Protestant Christian community welcomes me in to their spaces. So I'm getting plenty of invites from Catholic places, secular spaces, universities. That's booming. And, and so if I were just interested in just speaking everywhere, then I could be like, well, I don't need you people. But mm-hmm. I'm a Christian. I, I'm a Protestant Christian. I grew up going to events with Campus Crusade for Christ and Word of Life. I grew up in K-12 Christian, pre-K through 12th grade, good old Baptist Christian schools my entire life. Some may say, well, just forget about them. You don't need them. But I can't help but love that community. Mm-hmm. Because that's where my life has been. That's that's what I know. So it's heartbreaking for me to hear the very space that I've been in. I mean, and I've dealt with most of my racism in those spaces. So it's not surprising. Mm. But in 2023, it's disappointing. Mm. Absolutely, it is. By the way, if you're listening to this, uh, we're getting I'm getting some weird lag. And uh, so occasionally I step on Anika because I can't hear when she's finished. <laughs> That's okay. So um, Anika, you and I have both, I think, experienced some pushback from, again, for me, because I'm not Christian enough, but for you, I, I feel like you're actually probably, possibly on some issues more to the right of where I am. <laughs> um, so the only explanation for that that I can see is actually racism. And yeah. I know that 
I know how yes. difficult it is for well-intentioned listeners to acknowledge that there may be racist attitudes or racist perspectives in the way that they approach education. I'm wondering on a very practical level, in, in The Well-Trained Mind, we list lots and lots of classics to read. What are there things and, and we can we can put these in the show notes. You don't necessarily have to come up with them on the spot. Who would you add? Who would you tell people to go read or listen to or watch? Yes. Give us give us some thoughts. Octavia Butler, um, oh, yeah. anything she's written. And Kindred is so powerful because there's this running theme of Robinson Crusoe. Mm. And I just feel like that could just bring about a great integrative conversation with a work of the canon finding its way in this kind of modern sci-fi book written by the first Black woman to be made be made popular through sci-fi writing. Like, how does she weave that in? Mm -hmm. I would also put Anna Julia Cooper, I put Du Bois, James Baldwin. I would put every single Harlem Renaissance author in the list. And yep. the reason why I do have a strict rule and sometimes I get pushed back from people who think I'm too strict about this. And so I get pushed back from everybody just to be clear. And one of the things I, I do have a strict rule of mine is if an author demonstrates being part of the great conversation, meaning they're, they mm -hmm. are referencing some work from the canon and translating it into their human experience, they should be part of that collection of literature, right? And mm -hmm. so all of the Harlem Renaissance authors were inspired by the canon. Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, Langston Hughes, Alan Locke mm -hmm. was classically educated and actually felt that if you did not have that same type of education, you were actually inferior to him. Now, he's the father of the Harlem Renaissance. And he would say that about other Black. There's a letter he wrote to his mom about meeting some people who did not have the education he had who were Black. And he actually called them the N-word. It's harsh, right? Carter G. Woodson, also the father of Black history and the miseducation of the Negro. He's interesting because he has this classical background, but instead of praising it and elevating it, he uses it to prove how much we don't know about ourselves and how mm. we need to take that tradition and, and cause it to illuminate who we were before slavery. And so I could go on and on. Martin Luther King as well should be in there. Coretta Scott King has some writing where she talks about the importance of liberal arts education. I really could go on and on. And I think that's what makes people a little bit nervous is that the amount of diverse people, especially Black people who were inspired by classics, has had been in conversation with the classical tradition is so massive. Listen, mm -hmm. all H most just about, I always like to say the word just about, just about every single HBCU started out as a classical school. Mm. Yeah. Oh, 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 Susanna, we have to do a whole yeah. podcast on this. Anika, you have to come back. <laughs> I will. I am glad to. <laughs> Oh, yes. We're going to put this on the... No, I, I love what you're saying here, though. And it's making me think that maybe some of the pushback, some of the resistance is... How should I put this? Oh, my goodness. The world is so much bigger than we realize. Yeah. And mm. there are so many more experiences out there than we even have the capacity to understand yes. that maybe yes. part of what's happening is... And, and believe me, I am not discounting racism, but there's also a... a just sort of like a self-protective, oh, yes. how will I ever know everything? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So we kind of have to become okay with something that might seem anti-classical because I think a lot of times we think about classical education as we're going to master this core body of knowledge. Yep. I actually yep. think that yep. classical education is about recognizing that we can't ever master a core body of knowledge. Ooh, that's, what, mm -hmm. that's what Socrates said. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes. But that is not what, and now we're going to, I mean, we're coming up on an hour here. So I think we're going to have to do another, another <laughs> session with you, which yes. we'll take, we'll take many more weeks to schedule and cancel <laughs> and get back on the schedule and do it again, but we'll figure it out. Um, but I, I feel like what we're sort of getting down to here is this, just this whole envisioning of a classical education as understanding the human condition. Yes. Not, yes. Not mastering a core body of knowledge. I mean, I've always said that one of the ways in which classical education is very different from something like the core knowledge series, which I don't know how many big beef with, I just think it's kind of inadequate, um, <laughs> is that in order to be educated, there's a set of facts that you must master. Yeah. Yes. Now, yep. 
to be educated, you have to understand what it means to be human. And I think yes. Socrates would have agreed with that. Yes, you're absolutely mm-hmm. right. I mean, I think and this is one of the reasons why I'm not political. Like I have no interest in politics. Number one, I can't be conservative. I've gone through so much racism from childhood all the way up to, yeah. as we've talked about, this. it's just too painful for me to ascribe to that. I can't be Democrat either because my biggest thing is I, I struggle with them being against school choice. And as you know, I I work in, I work and I've lived in pretty challenged areas and I see the need for school choice, especially in certain challenged areas where black people want school choice. They, they're they not caught up in the Democratic, you know, they'll serve the public schools because even while people are trying to make public schooling better, they always leave off the most challenged neighborhoods. And so mm-hmm. and those families are the ones who run to the charter schools, run to the private school, run to the Catholic school that offer the scholarship. And they're literally, I have watched hundreds of lives changed as a result of school choice in the black community. So that's my big thing where I struggle with, with the Democrat side. So I vote for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that because I can't, both sides really frustrate me. And and I'm saying that to go back to your point of both sides hinder me from really thinking about humanity in that sense that you've talked mm-hmm. about. We get mm-hmm. locked into our political framework. You know, I was, I, was ta- I was talking about school choice the other day online and this guy, I mean, I felt like I was talking to a white conservative who was mad at me for talking about racism. He came at me so hard about school choice and that's all a conspiracy and they're taking the money from the public schools. And I was, and I said to him, listen, I was at the pool in my neighborhood yesterday and a student of mine goes to the neighborhood school and will not go to the bathroom until he gets home. He holds his bathroom for eight hours because it's so unsafe to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I and I was talking to his mom and I said, I can give you some charter schools that are no, nearby, some places that he can feel safe to go to the bathroom. And so when you come at me about being against school choice because you're locked in to this political agenda and you're unable to see the humanity of this poor child who literally says, I'm afraid to go. I don't want to go back to school tomorrow because I'm afraid of how dangerous it is. And when I texted him, he had to go home early. His mom had to go get him because a horrible fight broke out at school and he was not safe. He needs school choice. And that has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. This is about children and their safety and their well-being. And so classical education done in its truest sense should invite us to see the humanity of a person. It doesn't mean you Mm -hmm. can't vote. I mean, you vote for whoever you want, but that voting should not lock you in from being able to see someone's humanity. And that humanity may go against what your political stance is. Mm -hmm. And so this is what classical education is to me. I'm, I'm distraught that it's being kind of kidnapped by a political agenda Mm -hmm. because it's such Mm -hmm. a beautiful tradition that has been used to liberate so many people. Mm-hmm. And to set us all equal. But mm-hmm. like you said, classical education is about learning about the human experience and valuing our shared humanity. Oh, right. I love that so much. It's about our shared humanity. It's about coming to a deeper understanding, not only of what that humanity is, but what our frailties are yes. and what has shaped us. So, oh my goodness, Anika, there's so many more things we could talk to you about. <laughs> so we, we'll, we're going to do, we're going to do a second episode. So everybody hold on, it's, it's coming. <laughs> um, but I think we better wrap it up it. for for now. Thank you so yeah. much for being with us Thank and you. for sharing Thanks your for experiences. Finding. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. It was so awesome to have you. And for those of you still with us here, remember that you can subscribe <laughs> to our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I'm sure they're still here. That was a no, there's, enriching there's, conversation. Do, do that again, Susanna, for all of you who are still here. <laughs> You can subscribe wherever you're listening to podcasts. And also, if you have a question or a topic that you want to suggest, you can email us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. 